Maranatha Masala. It's, it's not every day that a minister becomes ministered to. I'd just like to add an extra blessing to the young lady and the choir for the powerful rendition. God is good and all the time. Thank you very much. Our text is called, it will be from, from two books. The story appears both in Matthew and in Mark. I will look at Matthew and look at Mark and then we'll go home. Amen. Are we together? Yes, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse, Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. I will hear from a, a resounding amen, amen when the verse has been found. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. The Bible said, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Sidon and Tyre and entered a house. And Jesus wanted to keep his presence a secret. 25. A certain woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard of Jesus and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syphorician by nation. And she wanted him to cast out the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus asked her, let the children first be fed. For it is, is it right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs? And then her answer is where we are going to discuss, where she says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. If I were to bring a topic, I would say, umakilwana Wait your turn. No one is after you. No one has done an evil curse against you. Just wait your turn. Your season is coming. Wait for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. But first, let the children be fed first. Are we together? I want us to retire from the misconception of over gratifying when things don't come our way and think our enemies are after us. Your turn is coming. Let us look at the book of Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15 verse 29 to 28 gives a narrative that mirrors the same story. Matthew 15. Matthew 15. But in Mark, Mark calls it a Syphorician, but Matthew calls it a Canaanite. Matthew 15, verse 29 to 28. The Bible says, Then Jesus went forth and departed into the coasts of Sidon and Tyre. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out from the coast and cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me for the sake of my daughter. She is vexed with his evil spirit. But he answered not a word, and his disciples said, Send her away, for she crieth after us. 24, but he answered and says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, Is it okay? to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. And she says it the same, yes, Lord, even the, do even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. May the good Lord add an extra blessing. In his name we pray. May the whole synagogue say amen. amen. Most kind and gracious heavenly Father, we are basking on mercy. We are asking you, Lord, may your glory advance and break every vessel of doubt. In his name we pray, may you all say amen. 
God is good. And all the time. Our text is found in both books. But before I begin my text, I would just like to give a short story on the birth narrative of Jesus that was very much overlooked. The Bible says, not much concentration is given on the birth of Jesus, but it is only Mark who gives us a, 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 an exposition of the birth of Jesus. Are we together? When Jesus was born, Jesus was born and the Jews believed that when Jesus is born, he will free the Jews from Roman colony. Are we together? The Jews believed that when the Messiah is born, the Messiah will free us from the oppression that was administered by Rome. At the time, there was a king called King Herod. King Herod was not the biological king of Israel. Are we together? Now, since he was not the biological king of Israel, he knew that one day, according to prophecy, there will be a king who is the legitimate king, who is the Messiah, and when he is born, his presence will overthrow the existing kingdom of King Herod. So King Herod knows biologically he is the king illegally. So he understands that according to prophecy, the real king who is the Messiah, when he is born at the rightful time, he will free his people from the yoke of King Herod. Now the Bible puts us very clearly and they say that Joseph and Mary arrived where? In Nazareth. And the Bible says there was no space to occupy Jesus and Mary when she was about to give birth. But, but walk with me. My issue with that statement is that Joseph was presiding from the loins of King David. And since Joseph was coming from the loins of King David, by customary, when there is no space for the descendants of King David, space must be created because he is coming from the loins of King David. Imagine U Tutuzani arriving in KZN and we are told there was no room to occupy Ututuzani. Back to the text. Joseph could have used his bragging rights as a position to grant him space in the inn when Mary is about to give birth. Are you with me? But we are told that Joseph refused to do that. During the same time Mary is giving birth, wise men arrive from the east. And they come to King Herod and say, King Herod, unto us a king is born. He is the Messiah. Are, are we together? Now at the time the wise men arrive from the east, they come to King Herod. When they tell him, King Herod, the king of the Jews is officially born. They are telling an existing king, your successor is born now. King Herod organizes a census to kill all boys who are born at that time. The writer says, Mary and Joseph could not find place in any house. So the writer says that Mary and Joseph find room in a stable of a donkey. Are you with me? Now, we need to understand this from the ancient Near East. Donkey stable were underneath the house in the cellar basement. The donkeys were put there because in those days, they never made fire to keep the house warm. 
when you put the animals underneath the house, when they breathe, their breathing makes the house warm up there. Are you with me? So the writer says, at that time, Joseph was comfortable to going under the house in the cellar. The census is, kill every boy that you see. While each and every boy was being butchered, no one thought to check underneath the basement where Jesus Christ was born. And there, his life was spared. I want to talk to someone and say, appreciate the doors that were closed in your face. They might have delayed your funeral and guaranteed your future. Not every door that is closed towards you is designed to oppress you. Sometimes our life is deposited by closed doors in our faces. While the heralds of today are looking to where you are born, they don't think to check in the basement in the cellar. Because in the still of the night, in that embarrassment of being rejected, your life is then guaranteed. Had it not been for the doors that were closed, Jesus would have been killed. I want us to move very quickly. When you read the Gospel of Mark, there is one profound thing in Mark's Gospel that I love. Mark's Gospel is called the Gospel of Secrecy. Siambakuni. Because when Mark narrates about the birth of Jesus, he says the secrecy of the birth of Jesus guaranteed his life. Are we together? So when Mark does this thing, Mark shows that each and every time Jesus Christ is speaking, he always wants to make the divinity of his glory a secret. As a result, the word secret in the book of Mark is mentioned too many times. The first time is in Mark 1, verse 25, where Jesus meets the man who is demon-possessed. And the demon-possessed begin to identify Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus says, shh, keep my presence a secret. Jesus Christ heals the man and tells the man, when you go into the temple and present yourself, keep my presence a secret. Siambakuni. Number three, the Bible says Jesus went into the district of Decapolis in Sidon and Tyra. And there he wanted to keep his presence a secret. <sighs> I want to talk to someone. Do not forfeit your blessings while they are still immature and tell everyone the dream you had last night. You might forfeit a blessing, rather keep it a secret. Because people destroy things that are premature before they even matured. So take this thing from me. Insecurity is loud, but confidence is silent. The more you talk, the more we realize how little you know. So that is the first preamble. And now when the writer begins to advance and show us that Jesus arrives in the house. In fact, I want us to discuss this thing. In the previous chapter, when you look at Matthew, Matthew says that Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Remember, he made them sit down on the green grass. Now, it is not me who says the green grass, it is the Bible. And then two chapters later, the Bible said, Jesus made them sit down on the earth. Walk with me. Now, in biblical language, when the Bible begins to say, and God made them sit down on the grass, the grass is only green on springtime. In the next two chapters, they sit down on the earth. Now, that is a six-month gap between chapter 14 and chapter 15. Are we together? So before Jesus feeds the 5,000, he makes them sit on the green grass. 
six months later, he sees a woman whose daughter is plagued by a demon. And he makes them sit down on the earth. Walk with me. When Jesus Christ had just fed the 5,000 with bread, Jesus was preparing for Passover. So for him to go back to Passover, from where he was to Jerusalem, it was six days. Not six months. So when Jesus had fed the 5,000 bread, he turned a six-day journey into a six-month journey. Instead of him going down, he goes further up to Decapolis. Because Jesus knows in six months' time, there will be a woman who is trying to run from Decapolis to Jerusalem. But because Jesus sees things in six months' time, he doesn't react, but Jesus positions himself to be at the region of Sidom and Tyre. So when the woman starts running towards Jerusalem, she finds Jesus at the reception of Decapolis. We worship a God who sees where will you be in six months' time. Then he positions himself and puts himself at the reach of your presence. So when you try to run towards him, he doesn't react, but he has been waiting for you there all along. You guys don't hear this. He's walking with Judas and all the disciples. He disorganizes time and makes a sick day to a six-month journey only to heal a woman whose daughter has an evil spirit. If he can do that for unclean people, how much more can he do for you? We worship a Jesus who disorganizes time. He displaces his comfort. And he says, in six months' time, you don't know where will you be in June next year. But I'm telling you, Jesus has positioned himself strategically. When you are trying to cry for him, you will haphazardly find him there waiting for you with open arms to attend to your request. We don't worship a reactive God. We worship a God who positioned himself before you knew what you were going to go through. When you go into the fiery furnace, you find him there waiting for you. But here is the part that missed many people. When Jesus is positioning himself for the woman, along the way, he heals a blind man. Wait. He heals the blind man going to the woman to heal her daughter. But along the way, he heals a blind man. When you think as if God is taking his time, it could be he's first attending to the needs of blind people, but he's coming to you. But along the way, he's healing other micro problems. Along the way, he is coming to you, but along the way, he identifies micro problems. When you were praying for God to come to you, because of your prayer, others are set free along the way. Your brokenness has moved Jesus to move from where he is to where you are. But because of your brokenness, others are beneficiaries of your prayer. While you not knowing that. There are people here who hate you not knowing that they are beneficiaries of your blessing. Because when God was coming to bless you, he left a portion towards them. Because there was too much for him to carry when coming to you. They are blessed along the way. Do not think that God loves you. It could be he was coming for your enemy, but he blessed you along the way. So the subject matter here is the one who said the prayer, God set me free. When he comes, he finds you. At you wait, let me attend here. He's still healing the blind man, but he's coming towards you. Along the way. Along the way. The journey is hard, but along the way, along the way, a six-day journey took six months, and others are healed along the way. We worship a God who heals us 
along the way. We were never part of the prayer request, but he was coming for the other person, but he happened to find you along the way. Other people are healed. No. God was coming for the other one, but he found you along the way. Along the way. I love that part, man. Because you were never part of the subject matter. Not to reduce your importance, but to understand that it is impossible for you and your enemy to hate each other. But God is going to bless you too along the way. Along the way. A six-day journey became a six-month journey. Only for one unclean woman. But I have a problem. I have a fundamental problem with the text. You know most preachers at Helderbeck, I have a problem. You know, ah, galas. <laughs> the woman was a Canaanite, according to Matthew. But according to Mark, she was a Sipharishi. The reason is because Matthew was working as a publican. Levi was his name before he was Matthew. Right? And publicans were working in the administrative office in home affairs in Israel. So when Matthew calls her a Canaanite, Matthew knows that in the Old Testament, the arch enemies of the Jews are actually the Canaanites. But now we are told that a prophetic flirtation that will set the Jews free also accommodates the enemies which are the Canaanites. Can I say something? Life is not a Nigerian movie. Nothing will happen to your enemies. In fact, they might be blessed before you. Do not think you can domesticate divinity because your emotions are too high. And in your prayer request, we are very strategic and very manipulative, trying to domesticate and conflict and imprison God to give in to your request and say, God, you know my enemies. But do you know what? It is because of your enemies, God heals you along the way. Do you see what I'm saying? He was not supposed to come to the Canaanite. He was supposed to come to the blind man. But because the Canaanite has problems that supersede the blind man, while he was going for the Canaanite, he found his own along the way. That is why Matthew is dramatic. Matthew says Jesus is breaking walls of segregation. Do you know why? He is coming for the lordship of Israel. Yes, my father. Matthew, Mark called, look, in those days, my mother, Matthew says that Jesus was outside in the street. Mark says Jesus was at someone's house. We can debate about this matter. Mark's gospel was in fact the first gospel in the New Testament. So Matthew, Luke, John, use Mark as a template. But Matthew is not lying. Matthew is saying the reason why Jesus is outside to Matthew, it makes Jesus unclean to be inside the territory of a Canaanite woman. It becomes a conflict of interest because we have been abused by Canaanites. But Jesus is in the same house as a Canaanite. So Matthew says he must be outside. He can't be inside. There is a conflict of interest. Let me bring it home. Jesus will eat, be in the house of your enemy and he will eat lunch and they won't talk about you. There are bigger problems to talk than about you. Stop being so arrogant and superstitious. What goes on in your head will not really happen and no one is talking about you. Yeah, let me tell you. No one is talking about you. People have other fish to fry. They are getting married. Do not think that there is a commonality of hatred when those who don't want you are suddenly in the same house as your God. So Matthew's argument is that no, he can't be in the same house because my recipients as Matthew are Jews. And it becomes a conflict of trust when Jesus is in the same house as a Canaanite. He must be outside. But Mark says no, 
he was inside, seated. And the woman came and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy for the sake of my daughter. Let's discuss this facet very, very quickly. Mark's gospel is written for Greeks. Now, since Mark is writing for Greeks, Mark is trying to argue that Jesus is for the Jews. But now, he's talking to a Greek woman. Why is he calling her Siphorishia? Because in Siphorishia, it was the, the tower of rejection. So Jesus stands with the custodian of rejection. According to culture, to talk to a Siphorishia is the same as sleeping with her. Have you ever met those people who don't hate you because you did anything wrong, but they have friends who have reservation against you? And for them to prove loyalty to their friends, they must inherit you as a Siphorishia to justify loyalty and trust at the cost of your presence. The fact that he talks to her, it is also a breaking trust barrier of a conflict of interest. You are talking to those who are compromised. But Jesus specializes in creating invisible bridges for those you think they are compromised. You are only healed because he was coming for those you think are compromised, not you. You were never the primary purpose of the prayer or the subject matter. But it so happened you were healed before them because you were along the way. It so happened that you were placed on the route when he was coming for your enemy. But he found you there helpless and he healed you. Now don't laugh at the Siphorishians because it is because of you that you are actually healed. Seemingly, I do want to understand the prayer of the Siphorician woman. Surely, her cry must be profound. For you to cause Jesus to disorganize his comfort. While he knows the cross is waiting for him, but you are the last person in his mind. But before I die, let me heal her first. Yeah. You always save the best for last. That's my argument. And the Bible says she begins to fall on his feet. Can I say something? It's not that deep. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not that deep. She isn't worshipping. She's saying something. It's not that deep. There are some things you think are that deep. They're not that deep. They're all in your head. In biblical language, when you want to say to someone, I have defeated you, you make them a footstool. When David writes about the victory of the, of the Israelites with the Edomites, he says, God will make the Edomites our footstool. That is why when Jesus begins to wash the feet of Peter, he knows I have been defeated. And he kneels down by his feet and washes them. So when the woman sees Jesus, she's saying, Jesus, I have been defeated enough. Remember, and then Jesus says, she says, Jesus, have mercy for the sake of my daughter. And then he says, is it okay to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs? In biblical days, Jews were identified as children. It's, it's, this is a metaphoric language. The Jews were identified as the children of the Father. And the Siphorishians and the Canaanites and the Gentiles were seen as dogs. Jesus asked her, is it okay to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. In ancient Near East, when people were reclining in the master's table, female dogs were kept underneath the table of the master. You know what female dogs are? 
in English for those who went to school. Female dogs were kept underneath the table and the children were kept around the table. After the children were done consuming food, the master craftsmen will then disperse breadcrumbs to the children. The breadcrumbs are not for the children to consume, but to wipe their dirty hands and throw those crumbs to the dogs. And then the dogs begin to consume the crumbs that fall from the master's table. But here is a problem. Remember Jesus fed the Jews 5,000 with bread. The woman is saying, is it okay to take the children's bread? He has fed the 5,000 six months ago. But six months later, he knows a crown is more to sustain her. What is an inconvenience towards you? It is a blessing to someone else. That which you throw away might be the answer to someone's prayer next door. The woman is saying, Jesus, I know there you fed them 5,000. But I know they are going to toss you in Jerusalem. But before they toss you, you are useful to me. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I want to believe there is more quantity of crumbs than bread. When things are broken, they begin to multiply. Yeah. When God blesses you, he has also considered your enemy that you think is beneath you in table value to be a recipient of the bread that you want to toss away. And then she says, Lord, even the crumb, and that crumb is enough for her and her daughter. <laughs> that is the, what makes the text to be pregnant. The crumb is enough for her and her daughter. Mamela, wait for the crumbs that have been occasionally placed and deposited for you. But here is the part that I love. Jesus does not say, is it okay to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs? Jesus says, little dogs. There is a big difference between little and dogs. Because a little goes a long way. Because a little is much when God is in it. But can I go deeper? In biblical language, according to Greek, when someone gives you a very perverse and, and, and dirty title, such as a liar, when the Greeks wanted to sanitize that statement that they give you, they add little in front of that word. So when Jesus says, is it okay to take the children's bread and toss it to their little dogs? She understood, now Jesus has changed my social identity as well. When God restores you, he also restores the social ills that have imprisoned your thinking about yourself. Because when God says, love your enemies as you love yourself, he was referring to the parts you hate about yourself that you must still heal from. There are parts you have not healed from yourself and you hate yourself because you have not grieved the loss of that career. You have not grieved the loss of that relationship. You have not grieved the loss of loss. Lower the coffin of your past and let the crumbs that are rejected by the children to fall in your presence. Before I sit down in closing, there's a very nice story that I love. There's a young man, there's an old man, 
he meets his former primary school teacher called Mr. Smith, right? They meet at the mall and then he says, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith is gray haired, he's old, he's on a stick. He says, yeah, I know I'm Mr. Smith, but I've been a teacher for a long time. I don't think I remember. He says, Mr. Smith, I became a teacher because you were a teacher. I lived my life wanting to become like you. And it's like, I'm, I'm glad. But Mr. Smith, you must remember me. He says, young man, I've been a teacher for 35 years of my life. I don't think I remember everyone that I taught. He says, Mr. Smith, let me tell you a story about myself and why you are my role model and what made me to want to become a teacher. Mr. Smith, I grew up in an orphanage home. I had a best friend in grade three. My, it was my best friend's birthday on Wednesday in the early 90s. His father had bought him a Rolex, a Rolex watch. And then he came to school to come show us the brand new Rolex watch for every one of us to pre-adventure, you know, this beautiful watch that is a Rolex watch. And so, Mr. Smith, this man is my best friend. At break time, Mr. Smith, I stole his watch from his bag. Mr. Smith, I helped my friend look for his watch while it's in my pocket. While he cried, I cried as well. Hey, the friends we keep, Mara. Mr. Smith, and then we came to report to you that his watch was stolen from his bag and we can't find it. And then you summoned the whole class. Says, guys, we need to find this young man's brand new Rolex watch. Second break came. It's not found. Mr. Smith, I was with you looking for the watch in their bags and we never found it. Mind you me, it's in my pocket. Are you with me? So, now, they then get to a point where it's after school. Then Mr. Smith says, guys, seemingly I've searched all your bags. Can you all just stand in a straight line? Mr. Smith closed the curtains of the classroom and switched off the lights and says, everyone, close your eyes and put your hands in the air. Mr. Smith, you took me and put my friend, myself, and the rest of the classroom. We lifted up our hands, Mr. Smith, and we closed our eyes. The watch was in my pocket. You searched my friend. You went to me. You found the watch. Then you continued searching. You went to the third person, the fourth person, the fifth person. Our eyes are all closed. He says, guys, I'm coming back. You walked outside and you came back inside. He says, young man, I have retrieved your watch. And he says, on that day, you protected my dignity. I then became the best man to my friend's wedding till today. He does not know I was the culprit who stole his watch. But it gets interesting now. Then, of course, they're talking. And he says, but I still don't know you. I know the incident. What do you mean, Mr. Smith? When I was searching the students, my eyes were also closed as well. I too myself do not know that you were the young man who stole the watch. We walk with people who protect our dignities at our lowest point. And then he said, I knew that that boy was the only boy in the classroom who had a parent. 
and the rest were orphans. And I understand your social station that you are placed in. You want to experience how it's like to experience a fatherly love. And your only sense of finding out is to stealing that which comes from a father. Deal gracefully with those who sin differently than you. It could be they are coming from an unstable background. When you find them, don't expose them. Protect them. Remember, the thorns you plant on the roadside to the enemy, your children might walk their bare feet. Number two, do not burn bridges with the Canaanites because your children might have to cross them one day in your absence. Do not make it hard for them to reference, I am the son of so and so. By mention of that, blessings are aborted from us. Do well with people. So when they post status updates, you don't think everything is about you. Do good to people. Show grace to humanity. Show compassion to the orphans. Show love to the widows. Show grace to the widowers. Understand those who are financially imprisoned. Understand that not everyone will receive the crowns at the same time. Last but not least, wait your turn. God bless you all. He has something for us this afternoon. So we, 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 we are encouraged, all of us, and even those of Angazanga Exene, to come and continue with this. I, I, I think these are life principles. Ekfanele Sibenazo in our generics. Let's do that. Please, Bazana, let's all come back. Avantabatala by Elwa, Ugutinabo, is it two o'clock? Half past two. Avantabatala, Bonka Bazazi, Utipang Avantabatala, a banner appointment, Yokuma. Let's all be here, and more of those that are not here. Sebong.